my kids have done some jobs where they worked for one of my other businesses where they were getting paid $10 an hour and they, they've experienced that. And then they've also worked jobs where they created something and did some sales. You know, they did some sales at a July 4th community event and made way more in 30 minutes than they could have made in three different Saturdays of work at the other business. And so they've gotten a taste for, you know, what is my time worth and how do I want to earn money? Welcome, everybody. I am excited today to have back on our show, Chad Willardson. He is the author of Smart Not Spoiled. He is a really amazing entrepreneur doing a lot of things, a family guy, really walks his talk, and I'm so excited to have him here. Thanks again for joining us today, Chad. Thanks for having me, Wade. Excited to be here. Absolutely, man. So Chad helps people enjoy life by helping them remove their stress about money. He's the founder of Pacific Capital, creator of the Financial Life Inspection, and author of two best-selling books, Stress-Free Money and Smart Not Spoiled, which we're going to talk about today. And he's the co-owner of multiple businesses. So what I want to do is first just, Chad, would you share a little bit about your story growing up? And specifically since this book, this focus is about helping our kids learn how to handle money and deal with it. Maybe share a little bit about your story growing up, what you learned that served you, and maybe what you had to figure out on your own. So this book, I, people ask me, why did you write this book? And I feel like it's a topic that I I wonder about both as a parent and as a financial expert. And it's how do we teach kids to be smart and not spoiled? So growing up, I was the oldest of four kids. And we were we grew up in a pretty middle income household. We weren't we definitely were not wealthy or, or up, you know, upper class at all. We weren't out on the streets, but we were, we just kind of got along and were able to do what we did. You know, we didn't go out to eat very much. It was too expensive. I didn't go to the summer camps or the sports camps. My friends went to, it was too expensive, but at the same time we had enough food on the table and, and I was grateful for it, but I didn't learn much about money. And as, as soon as my career post-college, I realized that this was my calling. This is something I really wanted to get into. I realized that there was this big gap of what do we teach kids and when do we teach kids and how do we teach kids about money? What And what do they need to know to help them prepare to be successful adults? And I have figured with my own kids, it's like, if I'm not teaching my kids good things about money, then probably nobody is because I'm the one who's supposed to be the advice giving expert. And so I just really, I, I didn't learn too much. I remember my mom balancing her checkbook at the grocery store and using coupons. And it was important to look for sales. But when it comes to investing or taxes or loans or budgeting or things like that, I didn't, I didn't have anyone really counseling me or guiding me on that. And so really my quest was to create something that became like a family resource guide with lots of stories and examples and ideas that a family or a parent could just say, oh, here's something I could talk to my kid about this week that's going to help prepare them to be more, you know, financially thoughtful and prepared for their future. So that's really the genesis of why I wrote Smart Not Spoiled. Awesome. And I know your background, you, you, know, you do a lot of money management, you help. Um, and in fact, share a little bit, if you don't mind, your, your sure. background about your business. And because I think it's relevant. I'm, I'm aware of it, but just I think it will help yeah. the listeners as yeah. well. My, my primary business is Pacific Capital. And we help entrepreneurs and families in all things financial, making money decisions as a family, as a business owner, um, a side business that could grow into something that's way bigger than this is a, a financial app that I'm co-creating with a bunch of really bright people around the country called Gravy Stack. It's coming out in 2021. We're looking to disrupt the banks on their debit card for kids idea. It's going to be a lot about financial literacy, teaching entrepreneurship in a gamified, fun way for kids. Typically ages, I think it's going to be targeting ages 10 to 18, but that's something I'm really excited about. Um, I'm a co-owner of MyFirstSale.com, which is teaching entrepreneurship to kids. We have some eight-year-olds and nine-year-olds who've started their own business through our website and are making five to 600 bucks a month which just instills a ton of confidence, you know, these little kids doing their thing. So I'm really about financial literacy and financial management. 
though my business, my Pacific Capital business serves a very small niche clientele of higher income, higher net worth entrepreneurs and families, I'm doing other things that is reaching out to just the broader community that can, that can really help anyone at any level. That's my goal. Awesome. Thank you. And you know, one of the things that's been interesting to watch what you do is, well, a few things. You, you do the social media well. It, it's hard to balance that concept of, okay, hey, I'm, I'm doing pretty well, but I want to be bragging and I yeah. want to share with people what's working and I want to be humble. You had a, a very simple uh, quote or, or conversation in, in the dedication to your kids where you said, it's not easy to balance prosperity with humility. Right. I think that's something, certainly at least in the uh, North American culture, we struggle with because we're told, well, if, if you, you talk too much about it, you're bragging right. and now you're just money obsessed versus, well, no, actually, you know, there's, there's part of this. And, and you mentioned a couple of things and I'll just throw them in real quick. You know, you know, the money does not make you who you are, but it amplifies who you are. It's only means to an end and people are more important than money. And this is the part of the dedication that Chad writes to his kids. How have you found as a father and as a parent that it's been now that your kids are growing up with more than what you had. And, and how are you balancing that with that whole thing that we as entrepreneurs struggle with of, okay, gosh, I came in hungry. Uh, and in my case, I was raised by a, a successful entrepreneur as, as you were, but at the same time, or a successful businessman in the case of your father, but yeah. that balance of, okay, well, how much do I give? How much do I not give? And, and, and what serves them and what perhaps, uh, you know, maybe weakens them if we, if we give too much. It's, it is something I think about honestly, daily. It is honestly a daily thought of mine. I mean, my business is around money decisions. And so it's, it's always on my mind and, and thinking about how not to ruin my kids is difficult. Like, um, uh, we've, we've aired on the side of, of over strict, overly strict, I would say in many cases, but we've tried to make them teaching lessons. I mean, the kids benefit big time that we like to travel. My wife and I travel a lot, so they go on nice vacations. That's just something they go on, but that they understand, I believe they understand that that's not typical or normal. And once they're out of the house, they're going to be paying for their own stuff. So, but when it comes to like just daily living and allowances, like, you know, today's my daughter's 17th birthday. And she asked yesterday if she could get her nails done if she could go get her nails done. So uh, when she goes out with her friends that she's got her nails done for her birthday, I said, sure, go ahead. Now she's paying for that herself and she had to earn money on her own outside of me. So I, I want them to learn that it's not just a bank of mommy and daddy to pay for everything. And so we've never, you know, we've never paid our kids an allowance. Our kids don't have an allowance. They don't know what an allowance is. They've got to earn money. So they've got a, a completely different program so I, I guess it's not about them being desperately hungry because they, they, they know that our family does well, but I think the independence can be taught and I think the mindset can be taught and I think they can still struggle and it's important for them to struggle because if they don't, then they're not going to grow those same muscles that I had to grow from, from the struggle that I had. You know, I, I moved out of the house at 18. I went to college and my wife and I got married very young. I was 22 and she was 20. And as soon as the day I got married, my dad was like, I'm never paying for anything again. You know, it's like you're, you're on your own for everything. And at the time I was making $6 and 25 cents an hour at a marketing call center, a survey center. And my wife was working, trying to find a job to work part time. And we lived in an apartment that was 425 square feet. And I make a joke that I could vacuum the apartment without unplugging the little vacuum. You know, I could go around the whole place and vacuum the whole place and I'd be done and then unplug it. So it's like that struggle was good for us. And I don't want to take away the struggle from my kids either. So uh, that, those are some of the ideas and the, the principles that I'm trying to share through this book. That's awesome. Yeah. It, it's always a challenge in our case uh, with me. I'd say I have a lot of free time. And so sometimes kids walk in and they see, oh, it's Friday. Well, you're at the beach. It's like, yeah, but I didn't start here. Right. <laughs> you know, I got here eventually and it takes a while. Uh, you mentioned that many people only talk about money when they're arguing or upset. 
Right. What does that do with children and their ability to then have that conversation? Does it become scary? Do they avoid it? How does that play out? Both. I, I think it's extremely damaging. And I've fallen into this trap before. You know, I've, I've made these mistakes. I'm not speaking about other people's mistakes. I'm speaking about my own mistakes. You know, my wife and I have had arguments about money stuff. And, and I've realized like, this is not healthy for the kids to associate money with something that's negative or contentious, or you don't want to attract it into your life because it's going to turn into family issues. And so I think the way we talk about money has a major impact on kids, even as young as four and five years old, because they notice and they feel that energy around the money conversation. So we're creating a blueprint that will last them a lifetime. That's awesome. I know that's one of the things, you know, people joke about what the, what the P Diddy song, more money, more problems. And mm -hmm. if you've not experienced that, you know, one of the comments you made earlier in the book of, you know, money's an amplifier. And I, I was blessed to see this in watching my father's success of the people that got more money. And unfortunately it did not make them happier because they were not happier people and of course, happy people and to start with. And of course the people who were doing well, well, they, they got to enjoy more things. Um, what I want to pivot to a little bit is more now some of the content of the book. But what I want to do is, if you don't mind, is you know, as I was looking through a lot of the content, a lot of this reminded me of things because I've had now lived long enough to know these things, mess up on some of these things, then have to revisit some of these. And I thought every one of them also applied to the um, entrepreneurs. So I'm going to really quickly, if it's cool, list the seven things in Go the book it. and then ask you to comment on them. So number one is invest early and often. Number two, borrow wisely. Number three, know their cash flow. Uh, four, feel comfortable talking about taxes. Five, learn to earn, which I thought was so huge from that entrepreneurial angle. Uh, six, protect who and what they care about, which is a lot about risk management and insurance, and then giving generously. What have you found has been perhaps the most powerful lesson for the kids? And what has been perhaps the easiest that they have grasped? I think the most powerful lessons would come from the learn to earn chapter about entrepreneurship and the give generously chapter about just being charitable and, and not hoarding and keeping everything for themselves. The learn to earn chapter, I, I think it's been hammered home in real life situations. As I shared in the book, it's like my kids have done some jobs where they worked for one of my other businesses where they were getting paid $10 an hour and they, they've experienced that. And then they've also worked jobs where they created something and did some sales. You know, they did some sales at a July 4th community event and made way more in 30 minutes than they could have made in three different Saturdays of work at the other business. And so they've gotten a taste for, you know, what is my time worth and how do I want to earn money? And I think that's a great experience for kids. I think it's extremely important, which is why I'm involved in the Gravy Stack app. Uh, the give generously chapter, I think has come the easiest because once you, once you see the benefits of giving and you have that feeling and that experience, it's something that you don't want to stop doing. And so we've tried to make it a point to really, that's one way where I think we've tried to fight, fight the, the pride of prosperity is to be a giving family and do, do a lot of things where the kids are sacrificing and giving themselves. And it's not just me writing a check to a charity. It's like, we're actually doing things together. We're serving food at the homeless shelter. We're, we're wrapping presents and we're giving, giving out the Turkey meals uh, at a place, um, for Thanksgiving, you know, we're doing service projects when we travel. That's something I write about in the book. It's like, you have to do things like that for the kids to believe it, that it's meaningful. You have to actually give time and effort themselves. Uh, it's not going to be the same if, if mom and dad just donate to charity and tell the kids about it. You know, they're not going to feel that. So I would say those are the two concepts that I think have really stuck out to me and the kids. Awesome. Thanks. I think those are so huge. I look at as somebody who grew up with somebody in a family where we were doing well and, you know, dad's a successful entrepreneur. Mom's always given us kind of thoughts and ideas about how the world works and our overall state abundance wise in the world to be like aware of where you are. And you know, it's, it's even still at this day, sometimes for me, I have to remember this whole thing of, okay, well, yeah, I'm, I'm doing this not just for me. Cause if it, when it's only focused on me, even as an entrepreneur, it gets very difficult for me to charge the premium prices to, you know, charge what I'm worth, all those different things, because somewhere there's this voice saying, yeah, but you know, somebody's doing worse off. 
And yet when I'm centered and when I am able to say, okay, no, wait, if I have this money, here's what I'm going to do with this and here's how it's going to benefit. And I might not be able to, as in your business model, you mentioned, you know, you target a certain part of the population and you might not be able to help everybody with that business model, but maybe with another business model, you help them. You share a little bit about that because I think for the entrepreneurs listening to this, and that's one of the toughest things is this whole dynamic of I want to help the world and my work could help the world, but sometimes the world doesn't have the money to pay me. And then so I find myself back in this, okay, I'm targeting the people with money. Does that mean I'm selling out? Does that mean, and yet, or are those the people that are serious that I want to invest time with? And I, I, I'd, Matt, I'd love to hear your perspective on that because I think a lot of entrepreneurs struggle with that in their charging prices and how they do things and how they balance that. I don't feel a hesitation on being a premium service provider in our industry because my intentions are pure. Like you said, I, I really believe that uh, money in the hands of good people is a good thing. And so the more the more that we can earn and the more abundance we can create for our employees and, and team members and clients, and the more I can do charitable work and do good for the community and for the, the world at large, then, then that just drives me to want to be more successful. So I think the hesitation might come if we have those money blueprints that money is the root of all evil instead of the love of money and the lust for money. But really it's, you know, money, money is just a means to an end. And so if, if we want to do good things in the world, uh, like there was a family that um, we found out about in our community who the, the dad was diagnosed with stage four cancer and he lost his job and they have four little kids and they're really, really, really struggling. And someone reached out to me confidentially and said, Hey, they, they really need help. And this new school year starting, they're coming back to school from COVID in California and they're really stressed out about they can't afford any supplies or backpacks or any of the stuff for their kids. They're out of work. And so I said, all right, let's take this on. And I talked to the family. I said, what do we want to do? What are we going to do to help this family who's struggling? And so we decided we're going to go, we're going to go to the store and we're going to, we're not just going to get the required supplies. We're going to try to go above and beyond and really set this family up for an awesome school year and fill up the fridge and do all kinds of cool stuff. And we went as a family, the seven of us, and went around the store, filled up stuff in the carts that we thought they would benefit from. And we went and delivered it. And the mom, like my kids were there and they delivered the stuff to each kid. So it's going kid to kid, right? And the mom is in tears. Dad doesn't speak a lot of English, but my older boys know Spanish. And so they were talking to them. And it was like this cool experience you walk away from that and it's like, I don't feel guilty earning a lot of money. Like I feel this is a cool opportunity to find and bless and uplift and strengthen people who struggle. And so th that's kind of how I balance it. As long as I'm continually looking for opportunities and saying yes to those opportunities, then, then I'm going to continue to aim for growth because the more good that we can do, the more that we grow, the more good we can do. That that's really awesome. I remember, I was studying some of the work, um, Deepak Chopra's work, and he talks about the difference between affluence and abundance. And he says, look, if you just get abundance and you hoard it, that's not really a good thing. But I guess apparently the word affluence comes from a Latin word that means to flow. And he's like, you know, so you, you keep the money flowing. So kind of the difference between the person that says, I want to earn a billion dollars and circulate that and do awesome things yeah. versus the person says, well, I want to get a billion dollars and put it in an account. And that has my name on it. You hear all the ego in there and the stuff that you and I have both seen uh, in the parts of the country where we live that, you know, that people, and, and it's, there's no anger here. It's just like, oh, you're, you're missing it. You're doing so well in this one dimension, but there's all these other dimensions yeah. of life. And when you circulated, I remember somebody once explained to me, he's like, look, if you put a, a check to a charity on auto pay, it's like you miss out on something that when you write the check or when you deliver the check or when you, you know, there's a part of it that's, you know, whether you want to call it karmic or, or how the universe works or how God mm -hmm. works or, you know, I'm not smart enough to know the answer to that. Um, but I think it was just something that difference of flowing it to say, yes, I want to circulate billions of dollars. So the idea of, you know, if you want to be a billionaire, help a billion people kind of a thing, as opposed to my account somewhere over here, which just has that energy of, ooh, that that feels like addiction. It feels like it's not going to go to a good place. That's a good point. Um, I've never heard that. That's good. I, I love and I've and I follow your social media and 
you really are one of the few people that does it well and walks that line. My brother's similar, like to show, hey, not not apologize. We're doing good stuff. I'm teaching yeah. my kids good things, and and there's abundance and whatnot. How would you say that's impacted your kids? Because now, and, and I've seen some of what I think I can see. I haven't I haven't met your kids in person, but I've seen what you're up to. How would you say that's impacted their decisions and how they lead in their lives? I, I believe my kids have more confidence knowing that uh, we don't believe in a scarcity mindset. I, I believe that they see the opportunities. Like we, it's funny, I was, I dropped off uh, donuts at my daughter's class this morning before work and had a little candle and I was by the donuts and literally the, you know, the lady at the donut shop was just putting the donuts in the boxes. And when I swiped my card, of course it asked for a tip and the options were like 20%, 25% or 30%. And in my head, I kind of laughed and I was like, man, you just put donuts in a box. Like you want a 30% tip for putting donuts. It's not like you made something, you know, and served it at the restaurant table. But I was like, what the heck, you know, and I just tipped her. And in my mind, as I was walking away, I thought like that kind of, as you talk about flow, that kind of not holding on to say, well, I'm not going to give this person $5. I'm not going to tip them. They don't deserve a tip. It's like, that mentality of, you know what, I am going to tip freely. I'm going to be a good tipper. I'm going to be generous with that stuff. And the kids see that. And I think it gives them confidence to say, we're not afraid to run out. Uh, if we run out, we're going to figure out a way to get back on top. And I think that's the confidence builder that kids can see is like, we aren't afraid to run out. We're not going to be reckless. You know, I don't, I'm not out there buying toys. I don't even own any toys, but we're going to have a good life and we're going to enjoy stuff. And we're going to just, we're going to believe in that flow and that abundance that it's going to come back to us. That's awesome. Yeah. I think that that's so huge. The energy behind how we do things and um, so much to that. So the other part that I just love is the invest early and often. And I'm, I'm old enough to say I've, I've done part of this right. And I did part of this wrong. And yet it's such that, that example, we've heard it before the, you know, what if you double a, a penny every day right. versus how would, when your kids started seeing that or the kids that you work with, how does the math specifically the compound interest, that lesson, how do you think, how does that land for them? Cause that, that was one of the ones that really, for me was like, whoa, this is, this is a big deal. Yeah. My son Pierce, who's 14, like uh, it, probably a year ago, it really clicked for him. And he was, he just started thinking like, wait, dad, so you can get to a point where your investments are paying you enough to cover your bills. And then like, you can really have more freedom about what you want to do for work, because then you're not stuck. And I was like, that's exactly right. But the earlier you start, and the more consistently you invest, the more that will grow to and it's like planting a tree, you can't plant the tree when you're 60 can't plant the seeds and just dump a ton of water on it and hurry up the process. You have to start sooner. And so we did some little calculations and I said, look, you're 13 years old. If you invested and saved this much every month for the next 30 years, here's how much it could grow to. And it just blew his mind. And so he was very interested and he's been asking tons of questions and he read my first book, Stress-Free Money. Now he's reading Smart Not Spoiled and I think uh, when kids can see the possibilities, that's what gets them excited. You know, it costs way less to invest early than it does to wait until you're older. Absolutely. Well, dude, if you've got your kids reading your books, I know that's a tough one. That is not an easy <laughs> one. Any, anybody who's yeah. not an author thinks it's easy to get your kids to read your books. They will read just about almost anything else. Like, oh, people pay you. People want to hear you talk. You talk so yeah. much, Dad. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, if you've got if you've got your son reading your book, you're that's for any of those who's <laughs> that's that that in and of itself is the testimonial right there, man. That says you know what you're doing. There you go. All right. So thank you so much for what you shared with us today, Chad. In the end, for those people who are listening in the show notes, we're going to list the links. What wisdom would you leave people with as far as if a person wants to just start, they haven't done much, they're trying to get their kids engaged. What's the first thing you'd suggest somebody does to get off on the right foot with your kids? I'd say the first thing is to begin being intentional about having money conversations as a family. I think talking to your kids about money is the first step. We, we often don't know what to say, so we say nothing. And the problem is they're still observing us. They're still watching us swipe our card at the grocery store or 
click the Amazon button and a box shows up at the porch. So they're learning about money, whether we like it or not. And my goal is to make it as easy as possible for parents, mentors, coaches, grandparents, whomever, to just start having those money conversations with young people and make it a comfortable topic. Allow them to ask questions. Hopefully in the book, and like I said, it's it's on audiobook, it's it's cheap on the ebook, the Kindle, whatever, but like hopefully you can find some conversation ideas and just get started. So at least you start talking to your kids about money and don't wait till it's too late. Absolutely. And for those of you listening, I'd also say, you know, I hear a lot of people talk about, well, they wish they had a book for their kids that they could teach in the school or in some way bring that money conversation, which I know you're, you're a lot about that too, as far as bringing it into our education systems. Right. This is one of those books that you can, if you, you don't have a, you don't, not everybody has to write the book. A lot of the times it's just about getting it in front of people and getting them to start having those conversations. So uh, thank you so much for that. Thank you for the work you're doing. As always, it's a pleasure having you here. And for those of you listening, as always, look forward to helping you impact more people and make more money in less time. Do what you do best so you can better enjoy your family, your friends, and your life. Thanks for listening.